Hey guys, this is lecture 4B. Um, it's over the terrestrial and aquatic biomes and how they interact with the you know, individuals, populations, and communities of an ecosystem. Uh, know that biomes is the combination of all of those communities, right? And also the ab abiotic factors. Um, at the end of this, you should be able to identify um, at least five of the major biomes, um, but there are nine and even some subcategories there. You want to be able to identify them by their, by their climates, uh, maybe by some of the the flora that's there, or the plant life, uh, but mostly the temperature and the precipitation is going to tell us what they are. Okay, so that's important. Those are the those are the ways to identify which biome you're in. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. Okay, and the way that you should be able to apply your knowledge, or at least be able to figure out which biome you're looking at, by looking at climatic, climate diagrams or climatograms. Okay, so let's look here. All right. The terrestrial biomes are defined by dominant plant growth forms. But what is that determined by? So let's look. The geographic region and a particular combination of temperature and precipitation. So these two right here are super important. So the temperature and precipitation will lead to certain types of plant growth. Obviously, you can't have a cactus growing like out in the tundra. You know what I mean? Like you have to have um, a good latitude for that sort of thing. So that you, we really care about the amount of sunlight, right? So the amount of sun which is based on the latitude, right? We learned about that in the previous previous section, based on the latitude, right? All right, so aquatic biomes are very similar, but obviously it's not gonna be precipitation, right? Because it's all underwater, right? So we're gonna be looking at salinity, depth, and water flow, such as you know, streams, rivers, versus open ocean, right? All right, look here, you're gonna wanna study this a little bit. Uh, you can see that there are some general trends based on where based on where they're at latitudinally on the globe. So look at the equator here. The equator here is going to have a lot of your tropical seasonal forests because there is a lot of rain in here, right? So a lot of rain. There's a high rain and high temperature, right? But as you go up 30 degrees and south 30 degrees, look, you kind of get a little bit similar climate. So you get this guy over here, right? See how these are real similar, right? All right. So the latitude kind of tells you a little bit about the precipitation and the temperature. Right? Okay, let's get right into it. So these are climat climate di diagrams or climatograms. These are the annual temperature and precipitation. So what you're looking at here is this is a double y-axis. Right? You've got annual te average temperature here, average precipitation in millimeters. And what you need to know about this is that for every um, 10 degrees Celsius you go up, you need another 20 millimeters of rain for growth. Okay, So that's important. So for every 10 degrees Celsius increase, you need 20 millimeters of rain as well, okay? And look here, um, why do you think that the growing season only happens when the temperature is above zero? Well, zero degrees Celsius is the freezing point, the freezing point of water, right? So if it's below zero, you're not going to, you know, have water for plants, liquid water for plants, so that's what they crave to grow, right? Um, when you have a temperature that's higher than the precipitation, then you're going to be limited as well in growth. The shaded regions of a climatogram are the seasons of growth. So look here, this uh, this example right here would have a longer growing season than whatever this climate would be, right? So I want you to kind of think of some areas of the world that have some rain, abundance of rain some parts of the season, but then have too high of a temperature for the amount of rain they're getting for other parts, right? So you're going to want to look at that and then look here, temperature drops here. So this kind of tells you something, right? This will, you know, you're probably looking at something um, that isn't a desert because it's got a little bit too much, too much rain, not quite at the zero line, right? But you're looking at something that gets kind of dry, um, gets kind of cold, right? Okay, so let's look here. All right, so here are the nine terrestrial biomes you need to know. Tundra, these are in the northernmost latitudes, and then we're going to start coming down in latitude as we go this way. Right? Okay, so boreal forest is a little bit higher, but not quite as high as the tundra. Temperate rainforest, now we're getting down into the north you know, United States, but not so high. Temperate seasonal forest, woodland, shrubland. So you see, we're getting warmer here. Right? We're getting warmer. Right? Temperate grassland or the cold desert, the tropical rainforest, right, which is right at the equator. Tropical seasonal forest or savanna, and subtropical desert. Okay, these are all of our these are all of our climates, our biomes here. The tundra, cold and treeless. Well, there's no there's really not a lot of water, right? Not any liquid water, so it's going to not be able to sustain tree life. Okay, below ground vegetation, the soil is completely frozen in the winter. Um, this is our idea of you know, when we get permafrost from an impermeable, permanently frozen layer. All right. So we have about <clears throat> four months during the summer. 
just the growing season. But again, there's not a lot of precipitation there. It just means it's a little bit warmer. So let's look at the climatogram for it. So here's our growing season. You probably want to you probably want to trace this somewhere. Um, you're going to have a in your study packet. Um, you have all the climate, all the biomes, and you're going to probably want to sketch this out to the side. So here's our here's our time zone. Um, moving right along. Uh, boreal forest. Forest biome made up primarily of coniferous evergreen trees that can tolerate cold winters and short growing seasons. See. Boreal forests are found between 50 degrees and 60 north in Europe, Russia, and North America. Um, the subarctic biome is very cold, and plant growth is constrained more by temperature than precipitation. So there's rain here, but the temperature is a constraint of the growing season. And the nutrient, this is important right here, the soil is poor due to slow decomposition. And why would you have slow decomposition? It's because there is low temperature, right? So if you have low temperature, you have low decomposition, you're not able to rot things, right? So that's something important. And also something to take into consideration is that these evergreens, these like pine needles and stuff like that, um, depending on what type of plants you have, they are going to be waxy and they're going to resist decomposition, right? So that's something to consider as well. Okay, so here's the climatogram for that. Okay, so this is in Canada, right? So a little bit further south of the Arctic regions, right? Uh, one of our activities we're going to do is you're going to pick, I'm going to give you a location, or you can pick a location, and you're going to want to know the biome for that. So kind of look for areas that are similar on this map here. All right, temperate rainforest, we're moving down. Um, it's coastal biome, defined by moderate temperatures and high precipitation. Why do you think that being on the coast would make it moderate in temperature? Right? Because you have that ocean air current, right? And, and because of the specific heat capacity of water, you're always going to have kind of the opposite temperature dynamic near water. The coastal biomes along the west coast, so here you go, there's some, some locations right here you might want to jot down and make note of those. Ocean currents moderate temperature fluctuations. Has nearly a 12 month growing season. Winters are rainy, summers are foggy. This is kind of a nice place to be, right? Mild temperatures and high precipitation have growth of very large trees, right? And you have some examples in your textbook of um, some of the trees that exist for, for, for California and Alaska are these gigantic trees. All right, so here's your temperate rainforest. Not too, too many places around the globe, right? You notice they're all kind of by the ocean. And why do you think they're only on the west coast and not so much on the east coast? Well, it has to do with these westerly winds, right? The westerly winds and the way um, the ocean currents kind of separate right here. All right, so look at the 12-month growing season. Temperature never gets to zero. The precipitation is relatively good in the in these mid months right here. We have higher temperature than we do precipitation. All right, temperate seasonal forest. Okay, a biome with uh, warm summers and cold winters. So it's a little bit more on the cold side here. With one meter of precipitation annually. Okay, so this is you're going to have some boom and busts here, right? Okay, one meter of precipitation. Here's some locations. locations. Okay, deciduous trees, so you're going to have some rotting here. Deciduous trees, you're going to get decomposition. Warm summer temperatures favor decomposition, and the soils have more nutrients than those of boreal forests. Okay, that's kind of cool. One of my lights is exploding in the classroom. That is awesome. Okay, so here's our seasonal temperate forest, so we have a wider range Various of these exist, but notice here that if the equator is around here, we have roughly about the same amount of height between these biomes, right? So in Stuttgart, Germany, here we go. Notice the temperature is pretty fluctuation, but the precipitation is pretty even throughout the year. Okay, and here's some examples of their deciduous growth here. All right, woodland shrubland. Okay, so this is. A um, little bit drier, with mild rainy winters. In Southern California, so Los Angeles, kind of around that area. Southern Africa, so South Africa, and the sea, the area surrounding the Mediterranean Sea. So this is really good areas of growth. But we have low precipitation in the summer and low temperatures in the winter, so we kind of have a little bit more of that boom and bust idea here. Wildfires are common 
and your plants have developed to adapt to fire and drought, right? There's some seedlings that only open when there's a when there's fire and they reach a certain temperature. Um, and one of the things to kind of think about here with climate change is that when we have more rain in areas that are used to fire and high temperatures, you're going to get a lot of growth, right? So higher precipitation, you're going to get higher amounts of growth, right, in these areas that normally wouldn't have it, right? Um, you're going to get plants that are um, that really like to they really like to get watered a lot. They'll you know proliferate a whole lot, but then once the summer hits, they'll all die. So you end up with a lot of brush. And then what's going to happen when you have a lot of brush and dry temperatures? You have a lot of fire. Right? This is kind of like a little bit of a feedback loop, right? All right, next. So here's our woodland shrubland. So we have more extreme weather as we get higher and further south latitude, right? So look at this climatogram here. We have a dip in water. The temperature raises up a little bit, right? And we're 20 degrees Celsius to the max here. Next. So here's our temperate grassland slash cold desert. Remember that deserts don't just have to be hot. Deserts are based on the amount of precipitation only, okay? So you can have really cold, like, arctic deserts on them. Here's what the tundra kind of acts like. Okay, cold, harsh winters, hot, dry summers. Has the lowest average pre precipitation of any uh, temperate biome. Um, the one in the colder biome is going to be the tundra, right? We found in the Great Plains, South America, Asia and Eastern Europe. We call these the steppes, depending on where they're at. Plant growth is constrained both by precipitation and cold temperatures in the winter. Plants include, include grasses and non-woody flowering plants that adapt it to wildfires and frequent grazing by animals. Um, this is one of those areas that um, you'll see in a minute. Like the grasslands are really good for agriculture, and you'll see you'll see this one right here, uh, right after this page. Okay, so here are temperate grasslands. Look at the temperatures. So up here is way higher than the amount of precipitation. And so there's not going to be very good, very good high growth of some of the plants we saw in like this, this temperate rainforest, right? Okay. Tropical rainforest gets the most precipitation, and it has like some of the most moderate high temperatures, right? So it's going to stay around this above 20 degrees Celsius. So we're looking around the equator here. Um, you have warm and wet summers, and it's pretty much just going to be warm and wet all the time. Very little temperature variation. And this is because of our Hadley cells, right? The Hadley cells that are here in the middle are raising up. So if I imagine the equator is like right here, and I was looking, I was looking at the Earth on its side. So we know the Hadley cells here are raising up air, and what's happening to it is it's eventually going to precipitate and reach a saturation point. So we get a lot of rain. We get a lot of rain right here, right? And of course, because there's the sun, right? That's hitting down on this section of the earth more than anywhere else, um, it's going to have high temperature as well. So it has a lot of temperature, it has a lot of precipitation. Right? So this is all physics right here. This all has to do with the way the cells are. Now, if you notice, I'm just going to go ahead and extend this over here, and now we're at like 30 degrees north. This is zero degrees latitude. This is 30 degrees north, and over here would be 30 degrees south. Notice as these fall, we get higher temperatures, right? So we start getting higher temperatures, which with adiabatic cooling. And so really, like, all these, like, biomes are determined basically by physics and how the cells work, the pressure of the air. Okay. Um, the forest, the rain, the tropical um, rainforest, the tropical rainforest is very important because it has the most biodiversity for any hectare than any other terrestrial biome. And a hectare, remember, was like 2.5 um, acres, right, about. It contain up to two thirds of the Earth's terrestrial species, and there's a there's an equivalent for this in the aquatic biomes that we're going to talk about. All right, so tropical rainforest. Here it is. You can pause this and jot down information. All right, tropical seasonal forest, so savanna. So it's still warm here, but not quite as much, not quite as much water year round. It has it has distinct wet and dry seasons. Okay, so sub-Saharan Africa, southern Asia, northwestern Australia. It's fertile, very, very fertile. There's low amount of precipitation, so the nutrients are not released. So that's something, this is the opposite of the, um, if we go back to tropical rainforest, because there's so much precipitation, there's a lot of leaching. There's a lot of leaching where the nutrients are kind of washed out of the soil. Right? 
So the nutrients that are in the tropical rainforest, even though there's a lot of decay, they don't stay for very long. So when you are farming, you can only use the land for a short periods of time, then you have to clear cut some other areas. So there's a constant motion um, and removal of trees. Okay. Tropical seasonal savanna. So you have scattered deciduous trees, and those are good for decomposition. In tropical seasonal forest slash savanna, here's the climatogram for it. Open landscapes. This is important. Why do you think human beings would favor something that has higher decomposition and is flat? Why do you think that might be helpful? Well, it's easy to work, right? You don't have to clear stuff. In a subtropical desert, biome approximately 30 degrees north and south, hot temperatures, high conditions, sparse vegetation. Mojave Desert in the southern United States, Sahara in Africa, Arabian Deserts, all the places you would imagine. Cacti, euphorbs, which aren't the same thing, but it's interesting because these have very similar features but are not genetically very close to each other. Um, but they develop based on the climate of a biome. So this is proof that the climate, so the temperature and precipitation, precede the vegetation, right? So that's why we use the temperature and precipitation to define the biome before we do the plants, right? And definitely not animals, right? Because animals can move all over the place. So we go by temperature. Again, I'm going to drive this home. Precipitation. And then thirdly, we do plants, okay? But not animals. Because they move. Suckers. All right. Here's our tropical, there's our subtropical desert biome, right? So look at the climatogram. Look at this right here. This is the exam question right there. Let me get rid of that. But see how the precipitation is zero, right? All right. So here's like a really cool way. You might want to copy this down. Look at the precipitation and the average annual temperature. So if we're looking at high temperature, high precipitation, that's a tropical rainforest, right? And as we move down to less precipitation but keep the same temperature, we get all of our other forests, right? So here's our other cores. As long as we're staying around um, this higher level precipitation, about about above 100 millimeters per or centimeters per year, um, we get all of our cores. Right? Okay, now look at our temperatures. As we get above about 15 degrees annually, we get outside of these really cold areas, right? The boreal forest. Why is the woodland shrubland down here? Well, we had some cold deserts and some seasonal um, cold woodland shrubland, right? The tundra is like the opposite of a rainforest, but it's also kind of the opposite of a subtropical desert. See how these kind of both get zero, close to zero precipitation between down here. All right. So this is a really useful graph to kind of look at. You might see that on a quiz or a test. Okay. All right. Aquatic biome. Just run through this real quick. Identify the freshwater and marine biomes. Streams and rivers, these are all freshwater. And remember we said we were talking about the salinity, the depth, and the flow rate. Right? Now it's important to note we're not really sure um, where to cut off, like where's the stream, where's the river, but you kind of know it when you see it. Same thing with lakes and ponds. These are going to have high flow rate. Going to have low flow. And freshwater wetlands are going to have low flow and low depth. Right? These are these right here are very, very important. Well, all these are important, but the freshwater wetlands have a lot of ecological services that they give us. So these streams and rivers. Um, flowing freshwater that may originate from underground springs or runoff or melting snow. They're narrow and carry very little amounts of water. Rivers carry water with larger amounts of water. Right. And it's important to note that a lot of these here, um, there is not a lot of algae that floats on the top because there's a lot of motion, right? A lot of motion of the water, so high velocity of the water means there is low decomposition, or I'm sorry, there's low algae, right? So our producers in flowing systems are not going to be things like algae as, for, as, for, as the producers, right? So we're going to be looking for leaves, like falling leaves from trees, right? And these are going to lead to decomposition. So why do you think it's a bad idea to clear cut trees near a river? Right? So think about that. All right, lakes and ponds, they have standing water, so that has some emergent vegetation. Right? Um, 
at least near the edges, right? When we talk about the littoral zone, we're going to talk about the littoral zone. So the littoral zone is shallow. So this is by the kind of like the, the banks, right? Like or the bay. Algae and emergent plants will grow. Emergent means it just pops out of the water, right? So if I have, here's my water. Here's my, here's my shore. Plants can kind of pop out right here, right? But over in the middle, um, the open water, it's too deep for these like plants to reach out of the water. So what you end up having is you have these algae that form at the top, right? So that's the phytoplankton right here. Our profundal zone is a region where sunlight does not reach. It's below the limnetic zone. And the benthic zone is the muddy bottom of the lake, pond, or ocean. So you get these little nitrogen, nitrogen creating things, right? The bacteria down there. All right, lakes and ponds. So here's a picture of that. Here's the littoral zone. See the edges here. Lunatic zone is open. We have like algae over here and stuff. And the profundal zone is where nothing gets benthic zone here. All right. Lakes are classified by level of primary productivity. Oligotrophic is has a low level of productivity. And this is um, you can have a very large lake, right? It has you know, a lot of things going on, but the size of the lake is going to mean that much of it is open water, and you're not going to have too many producers in there. Okay, mesotrophic, the lake with moderate level, and eutrophic has high levels of productivity. Like think of eutrophication, right? So this is the same, same kind of idea here. You know, freshwater wetlands this is important, very important. Um, they submerge at least part of the year, but shallow enough to support vegetation. These are some of the most productive biomes on Earth. Um, you have a lot of uh, animal life that lives there. You have um, birds and stuff that go and breed there. And these provide services for us. These provide a lot of services for us. These filter water. It's a recharge. Yeah, it's a recharge zone. They also help, um, let's see, they also help, well, the recharge zone is very, very important. But um, they reduce the flow rate as well. So they reduce the flow rate. And this is important because when we have storms, hurricanes and things like that, they act as a, this is a storm barrier, right? Or it's a hurricane blocker. This helps us a lot. When we have drought, it works the opposite way. It helps bring in water. It helps bring in water a little bit more to drought areas, right? So it's very, very important. And so when we destroy wetlands like in Florida, um, it's not a good thing for us because it messes it messes up a lot of the ecosystem and it, it, it gets rid of a valuable service. And think of some equivalent services that we do as human beings that are similar to the freshwater wetlands, right? Like um, primary uh, waste removal, secondary waste removal, right? So think about that. Okay, marine biomes. Here we have salt marshes. And remember that marshes, swamps, and bogs exist in freshwater, but we also have salt marshes. And they serve as kind of like a barrier between salt and fresh water. Uh, mangrove swamps are similar to similar to some of the, the swamps that we have in fresh water, but mangroves are salt they are salt resistant or they're they're tolerable to salt. Intertidal zone, coral reefs, and open oceans. Let's look at those real quick. Here's a salt marsh, and these are going to have very similar service service values to um, to our other to our to our regular freshwater marshes. And what's important here is that marshes, they are a, um, one of the most productive biomes in the world. This is like the equivalent almost of, of the, the regular freshwater marsh. But two-thirds of all um, crustaceans and fish, they spend their larval stages in the salt marshes. It's really cool. So think about that as a service, right? It's a breeding bed for the stuff that we eat because you eat fish. Mangrove swamp. All right, our mangrove swamp is salt tolerant. Our service, just like the swamp, and the marshes and, um, and the swamps in the in the freshwater, one of the best services they have is, is they resist soil erosion. Okay, so this provides stability to the ecosystem. Here's our inner tidal zone. This is just the, the wet part of the sand uh, when the tide goes in and out. And it's really hard to live there, but we have things like starfish that, that just wash up on there, and that's, that's the inner tidal zone. Coral reefs, this is like the tropical rainforest. This is the tropical rainforest of the marine biome. And shallow waters, um, has, the coral reefs are found. They have very poor nutrients, but it's still a hiding place for a lot of the, the fish there. Okay, coral bleaching, it's a phenomenon where the algae inside the coral die, 
and this has to do with high temperatures caused by global climate change and therefore we have high acidification or low pH right so that's going to kill those phytoplankton it's going to kill the coral it's a symbiotic relationship the okay, open ocean deep water located away from the shoreline with sunlight can no longer reach really not a lot here really low flow rate not a lot of productivity. It's the lowest productivity of all of our marine biomes. Here's a picture of that. You can pause this if you need to. All right, and that's it. And what you need to know about the last part, um, there is a little area in there, coffee versus sun and shade. Uh, coffee that is grown in the shade is natural coffee and is less efficient. Only has about one third of the yield, okay, one third of the yield. Um, but you have less habitat destruction. So you're able to keep your biodiversity up. As well as grow other plants, right? If you're able to grow other plants there. So one of the downsides to this is that you have lower money. Right? You don't make as much money per hectare. And you have to charge more money. So charge more money so you make the same amount of profit. And less people want to buy that stuff. All right. Well, good reading. Goodbye.